if you compared all of the countries in Africa, Nigeria is not the only one that has infrastructure limitations. The countries of the OECD, primarily all of the countries in the G20, and Nigeria is one of the 30 largest you know, economies um, in the world, one thing that you will realize is that electricity access um, is fundamental to infrastructure competitiveness. Many of these countries have electricity access at somewhere around 100% of population. In Nigeria, only about 60% of our population has electricity access, and the bulk of that electric power is diesel generated. What are the ingredients for success? And there is no one silver bullet. There are a number of options, but these options always have consequences. And what I'm hoping that we can do is focus on three to four big items which have a considerable ability to change um, our reality in Nigeria. And the first of those issues is for us to be um, clear about, you know, what is possible within our constraints. And that first message that I'd like to share with everyone is that no country in the world has ever been able to pay for all of its infrastructure. And so every country in the world needs to find ways of bringing private capital into infrastructure. And this is why capital markets are particularly important in this journey. There are a number of tools, there are a number of elements that can be used, um, all of them with market structures. Guarantees can be very, very substantial in enabling infrastructure investment. But corporatizing is something which even in countries that are not, um, you know, sort of, you know, um, market facing like China. Um, you've seen, you know, even in a country like China, um, the government of Beijing corporatizing a lot of their infrastructure assets and using the markets in Hong Kong to raise significant capital for infrastructure. The next thing is what we do around regulation. And regulation can be really, really powerful in enabling infrastructure. And what we have to do is to keep encouraging investments with the regulation. But it's also important that every time that we issue any kind of concession for infrastructure, we're making it a prerequisite that the winners of that concession will list their capital, either their debt or their equity, on an exchange in this country. Blended finance is an untapped source of capital. And in blended finance, we're talking both about the interrelationship between public and private partnerships, but also, more importantly, between private and philanthropic capital sources. Infrastructure funds, I mean bonds we all know about, and we have states, subnationals like Lagos, regularly using the markets in this country. Lagos alone has issued more than $2 billion of local currency equivalents in bonds through the markets over the last decade in this country. Um, seed investments um, is an incredible way that the government can use a little bit of its own wallet to try to encourage significant capital from private capital sources. But I'd like to talk lastly about asset management vehicles. Um, and one of the incredible opportunities open to us, and this was really the thinking behind Infracor, is using an asset management structure, basically, and a government seed to manage government-funded assets, and then levering on top of that private capital. And the best example of that globally is a company called Clifford Capital, which has been a very, very critical part of Singapore's success and its infrastructure development. The second reality that we all have to face, whether we like it or not, is that 
no country ever developed its infrastructure without doing so significantly in local currency. The 38 countries that have industrialized significantly since the end of World War II all have one commonality around them. And that is that whether they are a producer of infrastructure raw materials like turbines and so on or not, the debt of their infrastructure financing is predominantly done in local currency. And I'd like to quote a leading financier that some of you might be familiar with. Um, Tijan Thiam is a former head of one of the world's largest investment banks and also former head of one of the world's largest insurers. And he's the one who said, I did a lot of infrastructure development in my life. To fund them with foreign currency is madness, okay? Madness. And when you think about the devaluation story that we live with, and which is a reality of most developing markets and most high inflationary markets, it is very, very apparent that if we continue to finance infrastructure predominantly in foreign currency, we are going to end up with some significant indigestion at some point. And if you look at the rate of devaluation over the last two or three or even four decades in Nigeria, what is pretty clear is that the currency has devalued faster than the rate of revenues generated from a lot of infrastructure, the bulk of which generates Naira revenues. What is pretty clear is that the investor base for Nigerian debt has grown, and today major projects can be predominantly financed in Naira in this country. The constraint always is increasing access to FX liquidity to pay for equipment. But the right model needs to be you pay for the equipment in dollars, you refinance those dollars instantly into Naira, and you keep Naira debt over the long-term duration um, you know, of the infrastructure assets. I want to talk about regulation, and I'm really pleased that my regulator also turned up here. Um, and I want to talk about a key difference and something that we do not understand about regulation in this country. And this might get me into trouble, but you know, I'm one of these people that I like to speak truth to power. And when you get to a certain age in your life, you must be able to be allowed to speak freely. Yeah? Um, our regulators and government need to be an enabler and not an owner of the assets they regulate. And in my mind, there are three or four excellent examples of that in this country. The first of those is the Central Bank of Nigeria, which has stuck to its work as a regulator and allowed a banking sector grow. You also have the Nigerian Communications Commission, which could easily have gone wrong 23 years ago. Um, and I was privileged to be one of the founders of that industry in this country and enabled you know, private capital, enabled private investments rather than trying to compete. You will all remember we used to have a company called NITEL. And NITEL, um, for most of you who are old enough in the room, you will remember. Um, if you are lucky enough to have one of their 460,000 phone lines in your house, every time they wanted to collect money, they would just toss everybody's lines. And then you would have to carry your file and go to NITEL to go and reconcile your bill. Or if you had a child going to school in the UK or in the US, you had to go and line up outside a NITEL phone box to be able to reach them. And if it so happened that that child um, had to be in bed by a particular time, you could go several weeks as a mother or father not speaking to your child. And then something happened in January 2001. And up until October, November 2001, the regulator wanted to be a participant in some senses by determining tariffs. But the industry pushed against that, led by a number of us, and the regulator stood on the sidelines. 
and all of their worst fears within about three years competition dealt with. So first and foremost, when we launched these mobile networks, we were selling a connection at 36,000 Naira per line. In those days, $300 per connection. We very quickly realized that we would only sell a few thousand lines a month. So in December of 2001, um, we decided to drop connection charges to 10,000 Naira. We sold 50,000 in one month. We dropped them to zero the next month, and we sold 300,000 lines. And the rest is history. And you have an industry today with more than 200 mobile connections. But you also had a regulator who wanted to fix tariffs at that time. And again, we pushed back that if you don't have enough capacity, fixing tariffs isn't something that you should try to do. And the regulator stood back. And within two and a half years, the entrance of a new competitor called Glow and something called per second billing forced each and every one of us to self-regulate and tariffs came down. And you have other good regulators. Nigeria's pension industry is an excellent story of success. The SEC is another good story. Um, and then you look on this right side, and you see those regulators who want to be regulators, but they also want to own and manage assets. And every time that you try to do that, you will inevitably create something, which is a misalignment between yourself and the needs of all of your stakeholders. Yeah? NMPC remains still today, potentially Nigeria's biggest opportunity, but it could also be Nigeria's biggest challenge. And just sort of rethinking the way that that industry behaves can alter the course of the future of this country. Capital markets are a strategic weapon, if you understand them. And the applications of the rules and requirements of capital markets globally will have a very significant influence on the way that we form capital for infrastructure development in this country. And there are a number of things that you can very, very quickly do. And one of those is to insist that every time somebody gets any kind of license concession, they need to list something immediately. They don't need to list their equity, but they must start issuing debt immediately. And I hope Mr. DG and the NGX, these are themes that you will be pushing um, in every corridor of government, particularly when people start thinking about a new round of privatizations. The second thing we have to insist on right, is that every one of these companies must get an annual rating. And when you get an annual rating, what that thing does is to lift governance standards. Because what you have to go through to get rated just requires you to behave in a particular manner, right? And when people start behaving in that manner, you have the ability to raise incredible amounts of capital, right? and significant amounts of capital. And MTN Nigeria is one of the best examples of that. And we had the privilege as a firm to work with them on their first steps into the capital markets, starting firstly issuing commercial paper, then issuing a bond, and then subsequently two years ago doing that large equity offering, which was done digitally, the first time that's been done in this country. And since then, MTN has been a regular issuer using the markets every single year, raising hundreds of billions of Naira for its business. The most important things that markets do is to bring financial transparency around these things. And let me just share with you a message I like to share with senior people in government. Yeah? You don't need to fire anybody in NMPC. You don't even need to bring a gun to the conversation. But just wake up and say that from the 1st of July, if NMPC wants to raise Naira, it must issue a bond on one of the exchanges in Nigeria. 
if it wants to raise dollars, it must issue a euro bond. And without realizing it, you would have changed the culture forever. Because the first thing they will have to do is they will have to produce accounts by the 31st of March every year, like every other corporate in Nigeria needs to do. Second thing they will have to do is they will have to get on a quarterly investment call. And one day, there will be one young analyst from Chapel Hill Denham, right, who will ask on a call why their own you know, cost to income ratio is very substantially different from the cost to income ratio of Petrobras in Brazil or another national operator like them. 